Hello, everyone. Welcome to episode 31 of the Day Zero podcast. I'm Spectre. Uh, with me is Z. And let's just jump right into some topics. So we'll start off with some news. Um, some One of the biggest pieces of news this week was the facial recognition company uh, called Clearview AI, uh, which you know we've heard about before. Uh, there's been some controversy about them already, uh, but they're a company that works with law enforcement for facial recognition, and apparently their entire client list was stolen. <laughs> So, uh, you know, nothing like adding more to the controversy. Um, yeah, I, I find this, like, I find the way they've handled this a little bit interesting. Um, yeah, I don't know, I, it's weird. I mean, obviously the controversial statement is, you know, data breaches are just a part of life. Um, I believe <laughs> is what it was that they had mentioned. Yeah. yeah, unfortunately, data breaches are a part of life in the 21st century. Um, they also state that uh, security is Clearview's top priority. Absolutely, yeah. That's like that's the go-to PR statement. That's a copy pasta for uh, PR speak. Um, but I found it interesting that they said like um, they gained unauthorized access to the lists of customers, but the servers were not breached, and there was no compromise of the systems or network. So I thought that was I, interesting but, too at first. My thought is that it's a third-party vendor. Um, and that kind of okay. goes with the lack of information that was actually disclosed. Like, they didn't get access to the images. They didn't get access to the search history. They got access to some customer meta information. So, obviously, they got access to, like, customer names. They could also see the list of user accounts the customers had and the number of searches conducted by that customer. But they didn't okay. have, like, really detailed access. So, my guess here is that this was a third-party bot where that comes in is they also make it clear that they fix the vulnerability. They don't mention like they don't make mention of any third party, which is definitely what makes it a little bit odd. Because yeah, the company says you know also said it fixed the vulnerability, which is sounding like they did something, not just like we had our vendor or whoever actually had the issue. Um, patch it yeah. so that sounds like it's their responsibility and then it would be their server unless they're like oh well that's hosted in the cloud so it, it's amazon servers none of our servers were compromised it, it sounds like this could be some sort of weasel word or yeah, wording because yeah like saying you know vulnerability and that they fix it that implies that their server was breached so yeah it, well, seems it like implies really like there was a breach and then the fact that yeah. they could fix it seems to indicate that it was their server because they have control to be able to fix it um i mean it's clear there there's some attempt to kind of downplaying this so there's a chance that we might be hearing in the future that hey more information was actually leaked than they kind of let let no one yeah um i think i also saw some people actually from law enforcement speaking out about this saying you know it's kind of shaken their trust that security seems to be uh despite what they say not a top priority at clearview um, I mean, it's really hard to say you know it depends on what the actual issue was like if this was a third-party vendor that they were just working with who had the compromise like i can't really put the blame on clearview then if they had no control over but they do make it seem like they do have control and thus would be their fault but again i've always tried to look at you know how does the company respond to the issue and I i'm not too happy with how they've responded to this but at the same time, I'm not one of their customers, so I haven't seen what their actual notification to customers look like. Yeah, I did try to find it, but to them. Yeah. yeah, so the lack of transparency, um, you know, raises concerns. Like I've mentioned before, it's a major breach, just like with LastPass. You know, it's their response that kind of gives me some trust, not in the fact they made a mistake. I uh, just want to say uh, clear view, transparency, you know, kind of... Uh kind of an oxymoron there <laughs> but uh yeah just you know piling up the good pr for that company um but yeah, yeah this, well this it sounds like I, you were talking about the other issues kind of with them or other controversy it sounds like they're being sued by like facebook and some other companies of that nature just because they were scraping information although i wonder how far that'll go uh simply because i know recently there was a case that can set, kind of set the precedent that scraping was legal and that's what clearview has kind of been doing um they've been it's open source intelligence so they search the open web generally speaking you would expect that to be scraping um they weren't necessarily using 
like the API or something, which can have terms to kind of rate limit and, you know, messing with that. Whereas I think there was a recent case that basically established that you can't be trying to prevent the scraping. Um, Technically, though, isn't it like when you upload images to Facebook or anything like that, that those images become property of Facebook and therefore, like, you have to get permission from them technically to use it? Uh, so that that's like... coming down into a question of copyright and the usage of it, um, okay. which is an area I'm just not, I mean, I'm not a lawyer at all anyhow. Oh, yeah, fair enough. But I, I've, I I've seen that raised, and I do recall actually a fairly comprehensive response coming up to it about how copyright, it's not a violation of copyright, but I don't recall that. Um, okay. And it's not a discussion I'm really prepared to go into. Oh yeah, fair enough. It's just you know something that kind of it's a fair point. It. Yeah, um, but yeah, we'll we'll get into some more uh, you know upbeat news. Uh, well, maybe we'll we'll see. This this is another kind of controversial post, and that's uh, Firefox um, pushing DNS over HTTPS by default for US users. So we've talked about. Um, you know, DNS over HTTPS a little bit before. I think we talked about it when we were talking about the DNSSEC key ceremony uh, being delayed. Maybe how... briefly. Yeah, I don't think we've much. ever really gone into it. Yeah, but, you know, DNS has never really been considered secure, um, at least, you know, excluding DOH. There's no encryption on it, really. Um, other devices, you know, in the root can collect DNS lookups, alter them, uh, can block them entirely. Uh, and DNS over HTTPS is you know, trying to prevent that. Uh, sorry, yeah, were you well, going to say something to see? It, it ends up breaking visibility into DNS requests is kind of the key thing. Um, and for a long time, as you mentioned, we've DNS hasn't been encrypted. There have been plenty of ways to kind of mess with DNS requests. That's how a lot of systems, you know, some people might be using on a daily basis work. Ad blockers like uh, Pi-hole, where you'd put a Pi onto your network that just watches for the DNS requests and... Um, Actually, so Pi-hole, I think, will run a DNS server, uh, and it'll try and make itself the default, but it also just watches for them. So it can, without needing to do any configuration, essentially spoof the DNS response. Be like, nope, this is, like, you can't resolve this domain. Um, and I mean, there are good uses for being able to see into the DNS requests. As I mentioned, ad blocking can work on that. Corporate kind of malware detection, noticing, you know, hey, this computers looking up this you know malware domain it's looking up a command and control server maybe we should do something about that on the Even other with hand the ps4 i use it too i use it to block uh like basically to air gap the ps4 from sony servers so yeah and i, <laughs> I mean we kind of take or at least so on the save mgo project running a private server for a ps2 game um we encourage people to change their dns but at times we have used other mechanisms like trying to spoof the responses where people couldn't for whatever reason make those changes so i mean there are definitely legitimate uses for it there are also several illegitimate uses for it malware just sitting on your machine or sitting on the network i should say uh can intercept those requests spoof a response or what we've seen are isps injecting ads um yep. especially common ISPs in the us the yeah um, and of course, ISP simply selling that DNS information kind of, there's a profile of all these websites you're visiting and when obviously it's not insanely granular, but it is every website that you visited. And, and they also do, I think, uh, there's been cases, uh, or at least alleged cases of ISP censoring, uh, through DNS as well. Oh uh, no, that, that's not alleged. Sites. That's how the or... UK porn block works is DNS. Oh, okay. Fair enough. Oh, um, like that's definitely done. That's I just how to say alleged. So I was safe in case I was like, you know, maybe a little bit wrong. <laughs> yeah, no, there, there are definitely places doing that. The Pirate Bay has kind of been faced with that. Um, no. Having their domains being blacklisted um, over DNS. So like there's definitely that. And this breaks that ability. This makes it to your DNS request to the DNS over HTTP provider, HTTPS, sorry are encrypted you know it's over https so you have the same securities uh the certificate the certificate being checked all of that um with your dns request yeah so i mean you mentioned pi hole and 
when I looked into some of the responses around this article, uh, there was actually quite a bit. It was more controversial than I thought it would be. I thought overall it would be like a net positive. Um, but there were a lot of people, uh, some people mentioning Pi-hole specifically, saying this would break that functionality and they're not happy with that. And uh, mostly what it seems like is people aren't happy that it's being forced by default on people. Um, like, I don't think people have any issue with the option being there, but they don't want it enabled by default. So I was at wondering like, maybe time, we could have a bit of a discussion around that. Yeah, well, I was going to jump right into it at the same time. Like, I, I understand that position, um, um, you know, because Pi-hole especially is insanely useful because anybody that joins your network then gets, you know, all of the ad blocking and all of that. Really useful. Where the problem kind of comes in, though, is the average user is not on such a network. The average user is using their ISP. The average yeah. user isn't changing the default. Obviously, Pi-hole doesn't. Like, Pi-hole is a very particular case. That means you're going to have to um, effectively do some of your own customization or changing your own options. It's It's absolutely a legitimate concern. I think the net positive, though, is ISPs are actively using DNS maliciously. I, well, we can debate, you know, if their actual malicious intent versus just for profit, not really malicious, whatever. In my opinion, they're actively using it maliciously. They are actively a threat against the average user. Uh, so I would argue that it is a net win for um, the ISPs to be losing out on access to HTTP or on access to the DNS queries. And I think like an additional point on that is since like you were saying, most people, this, you know, DNS over HTTPS isn't going to uh, disservice them in any way, really. Uh, you know, some of those people that are using those specific use cases, typically, you know, somebody who's running Pi-hole, they are going to be more technically literate and it's going to be a lot easier for them to go in and change settings to, you know, turn it off if they need to. Whereas I think a lot of people out there that are just everyday PC users, uh, you know, they're not even, they're pro they probably don't even know what DNS over HTTPS is. They don't really go into their settings. They're not going to change defaults. So no, I think by but, uh... default secure is probably a better option than by default non-secure, I guess. Yeah, of course. Um, and actually, uh, Joey in chat, I'm not going to try and say the last name there, uh, mentions that a lot of these use cases of DNS seem more like abuses of the protocol. And I completely agree with that. There are things that we've kind of, DNS is built up reasonably insecurely. A lot of trust existed there. And nowadays we do have all these things that are kind of built on the effect of abuse of that, like spoofing responses is not an intended part of the protocol. That's not kind of where it was intended. It's just, it's been around forever and allowed that. Um, but I'd agree like those are abuses and, but jumping back towards what you were saying, Spectre, I mean, yes, the, a lot of the people that are using Pi-hole are also going to be able to configure for themselves, but they're using Pi-hole so that everybody else doesn't need to configure it. Um, I, like, I think okay, that's, that's a very point. legitimate use case and a very legitimate problem, but it's a very, the amount of people that run networks that uh, use Pi-hole is much smaller than the amount of people that use their ISPs DNS by default and like are yeah. just doing that. Like, it's such it's, a, it's, it's such a like minority. It's sacrificing one person for a thousand kind of mentality. Um... Yeah. And then the other kind of main issue I've seen come up just deals with Cloudflare. Default, yeah. Firefox is using Cloudflare. And there's definitely concern that Cloudflare is going to be the next Google. You know, Google, we already know their, their main product was, of course, ads and selling ads. So selling your profile, in effect, I mean, kind of, kind of through a layer of abstraction, but... At, at least for me, like, first of all, you can use other providers and other providers do exist. But again, people are going to use the defaults. I trust Cloudflare more than I trust your local ISP. Oh, yeah. So, I mean, that's kind of one big point. Like, I could understand maybe making people choose a provider, but who knows how to choose one besides people that are going to be able to go and do it anyhow. I mean, who knows the difference between Google's offering versus Cloudflare's offering versus OpenDNS or whatever else DNS, is. DNS, yeah. Uh, whatever else is actually offering. 
Yeah, I mean, so some of the like discussion I was seeing around Cloudflare was more about um, they've actually been caught with like censoring pages in the past too. Uh, a lot of people were saying, why not use NextDNS? Uh, one thing that like NextDNS seems to be like the most popular one that I could find with people. The problem is uh, NextDNS and probably a lot of other alternatives are paid. So obviously Firefox isn't going to enforce a default that requires you to pay to use it. Uh, that just doesn't make any sense. Uh, Cloudflare is free, so that's why they went with that avenue. Uh, um, apparently Comcast offers one. I just pulled up <laughs> uh, the one case here that... <laughs> Yeah, com- yeah, I I think the default should be Comcast. Yeah, for clearly sure. sarcastic, but um, <laughs> I I have kind of pulled up a list here of some publicly available servers. Yeah, honestly, I don't think personally I have too much of an issue with Cloudflare. I mean, you know, they're not perfect, but no, and I mean uh, the censorship is a fair issue, and that's something we're seeing a lot more just in general regarding censorship around extremist material, around things that just society as a whole hasn't been liking. And I think we could have a fairly lengthy discussion about kind of free speech and who should be protecting versus not. That said, at this point, I would rather Cloudflare than because ISPs are also known to do exactly the same thing. So it's not like this is more often some, probably. Yeah, so at so, least Cloudflare has usually been fairly vocal about privacy in general. And that's kind of one of the things I want to bring up is Cloudflare, their main product has to do more with security, where they can kind of benefit off of seeing some of the traffic information, but not from selling that off, not from sharing that with third parties. So I, I don't know, I... Because of Cloudflare's history, at least at this point, I trust them more than something like Google. Um, I could absolutely understand why people have some distrust. I'm saying, you know, personally, um, I would rather see, you know, Cloudflare doing that because they do have at least a reasonable history. They're not somebody that I've generally seen as abusing their position. So overall, you think that benefit? Uh, in on behalf of Firefox, yeah, especially compared to ISPs, it, it's definitely a net benefit. Yeah, uh, that that's what, that was my thought as well. Uh, I was actually surprised and kind of caught off guard by how many people seem to be, uh, you know, opposed to it. That being said, I mean, obviously, you know, there's that old mantra of, uh, you know, vocal minority. Um, so you know, maybe it's not that many people. Maybe overall, it is received well. Uh, but you know, it's just one of those things where I was a little bit surprised that. Uh, Oh, and there there are some fair points um, against maybe having it as a default, mainly, you know, the pie hole note that you talked about. Yeah, like it, there isn't really another option for the pie hole, but I think kind of like uh, Joey and Chad mentioned, they're like, it's an abuse of DNS more than a valid use case. And yes, it is really useful abuse, but I would rather see that resolved and maybe we'll come up with a new solution for that or see devices maybe supporting um, some other method of getting the configuration i'm sure some of them already do because i mean you've got the configuration for like proxies and stuff so i mean i i'd rather see a new solution than just keep using the old one just because you know it's been there for a while yep Um, i will also mention just as an interesting point uh cloudflare also offers dns over HTTPS over tor oh interesting I didn't realize that. Um, or at least Tor it mentions, forever, but... yeah, I, I'm not active on Tor, but it's mentioned that it's also available via Tor Onion service. Oh, okay. Which I thought was an it's interesting kind of point. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so speaking of Cloudflare, uh, they actually have another blog post about securing memory at epic scale. Uh, it's actually EPYC, but, you know, we got we got the pun out of oh. the way. It's a, it's a pun title. Um, but yeah, so this, this talks about... Uh, it, it touches on something we've talked a little bit about uh, privately before uh, between me and you. And that's more about like, um, you know, you can store things on the server encrypted in cold storage all you want. But when it's live in memory, it's going to be in plain text. It's going to be decrypted, which is a potential concern. Uh, and I think we've we've talked about that quite a bit in the past with just, you know, whatever we were doing at the time. Um, yeah. And just clarify on that, like that comes down to like, you know, the value of full disk encryption on a server which is running all the time it always needs access to decrypt the contents so it only protects against power goes out or somebody tries to steal the hard drive like yeah so 
that's what Cloudflare was trying to tackle, uh, was uh, being able to encrypt memory via the secure memory encryption uh, x86 in- extension uh, that's available to the AMD EPYC processors. I'm not sure what EPYC stands for. It's probably just their model. I couldn't really find much on it. Um, yeah, but- that, that's just their model name, like Ryzen. Yeah. Epic yeah. is their server line. It's uh, Xeon for Intel um, is their server line, and Epic is AMD's server line. Yeah. So it's basically just a trusted execution environment uh, through the AMD secure processor. Um, but one of the big things that the article touches on is, obviously, if you're going to be encrypting memory contents, the question you immediately have is, what about the performance overhead? That sounds like something that would be very expensive. Um, but what was actually kind of interesting and really surprised me was across all of their data points, I think they did like 11 tests, they found their average overhead was about 0.7%. That is far lower than I thought it would be. Uh, that actually, that seems pretty promising. Uh, it seems almost too good to be true in a way. Um, I, I definitely expected it to be way higher. So It is still significant though. Um, I would I wouldn't call that an insignificant performance, especially when we're talking about, um, you know, servers generally speaking needing a lot of their performance. Yeah, uh, you know, seeing that drop is is a significant drop. Um, if for a company that's able to kind of afford that drop, great. Yeah, uh, I mean, I don't know, under one percent though, like that's. I feel like that would only really impact edge cases, really. True. I mean, it, it is. It adds up over time. It yeah. is lower than I'd have expected to. Yeah. Um. But yeah, like I said, it almost seems too good to be true. I do wonder if like some of them are cherry picked. I don't. I don't know. Well, you know, so I'm just saying like it. It seems kind of. I, I was just really caught. Can off. you find like? So I'm seeing like the under five percent, not under one percent. Um, search for 0. 0.66. I think it was 0. 0.66 something that they said was the uh, average across all their tests. 699. Sorry. Yeah, okay. I found yeah. it here across 11 data points. The drag down. Hmm. So, the, you know, they're basically saying that, you know, through these tests, it shows that it can be used at scale. Um, that being said, I mean, this isn't going to prevent all attacks. I mean, if an attacker can execute code on the CPU with access to the decryption keys, uh, you can get around it. I mean, it is an extra step, which is, you know, all you can do in some cases. Uh, But, you know, if you have like an exploit or something on the server, you can still get the keys to decrypt the contents in RAM if you really wanted to. Um, But I think... Yeah, it's just an additional layer yeah of uh protection there especially since it is is using a secure enclave although amd hasn't exactly had a um good history in terms of their uh secure enclaves compared with intel's i don't know like we've been covering sgx quite a bit lately and there's a lot of people saying that sgx should just be dropped at this point yeah, um, but that's mostly, I believe, because AMD's kind of already just kind of been owned and been done with. Well, perhaps I'm mistaken. That isn't an area of significant experience for me at all or any experience. Um, yeah. But at least my understanding was that AMD's was basically not not really up to par. Yeah, I'm, I I can't speak either, like, with certainty. Um, from what yes. I've seen, though, AMD's, like, secure processor stuff is actually, it's gotten better. Uh, okay, like, like, you know, like I said, it's it's not an area of, like, any of my research, so I can definitely be wrong. Don't, you know, do your own research on that if it actually matters to you. Um, oh, for sure. Yeah. That said, uh, you know, Joey also mentions it's useful against uh, people taking out your RAM sticks and keeping them frozen. That was um, a common use case I saw. Yeah, that's definitely like, because that's something law enforcement will do. They raid somebody, somebody comes right in there to freeze the RAM so that they can uh, extract information off of it and use that later. Yeah, I just want to make sure. I think that's called a cold boot attack, right? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, I just wanted to make sure I was right on that. So yeah, that's that was the common thing I was seeing was that this would be useful for preventing cold boot attacks. 
Uh, that being said, I don't know how many people are really going to be pulling off cold boot attacks on servers uh, outside of law enforcement, maybe. But uh, yeah, I mean, overall, I think it's a net benefit considering how low the performance overhead actually is. Um, I, I was trying to find in the article, I couldn't really find much information on like when they would be trying to like roll this out and if it would be toggle, like uh, if it would be enabled by default or anything like that. Well, uh, I it, I mean, def it's Cloudflare. I mean, it's kind of a cloud service. You're not... I, I imagine when they roll it out, they'll just roll it out slowly over all their things and then everything will kind of have that. Or I guess it might yeah, be probably. another... It might be a professional offering, like a service you can pay into. Uh, but given kind of how Cloudflare's been, I would imagine that they're looking at this with the intent to just... Uh, roll it out kind of over their entire network. Yeah, I guess I just wish there was a bit more information about when they were planning on trying to do that. Uh, I imagine they, they don't know yet. You yeah, know, if they're just seeing true. this initial research on it, they're probably, they probably don't have a rollout schedule yet. Yeah. Maybe, maybe we'll stick a future article on that. Um, I, if they roll it out, I would imagine so. Yeah. So we have a kind of fun article up next, uh, which is about a hacker's mom breaking into prison uh, and the warden's computer. So this was put on Wired. And uh, like I said, this is kind of just more of a fun story. Uh, it's most, mostly social engineering, so it's not too technical. But we like fun stories, so we'll cover it anyway. Um, but yeah, it was basically... Uh, I think it was a pen tester, uh, John Strand is his name, as it says in the, the article there. Um, and, you know, he got his mom to basically infiltrate the prison. Yeah, and when I first when I first saw that, my initial thought was, um, you know, I wonder how the prison would feel about, you know, such a violation of an NDA. But uh, I guess his mother was also the CFO of the security firm. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, so I mean, th there, she was inside, so there's no issue kind of with the NDA because she's part of the company and would have had kind of internal information. But yeah, it's just, I don't know, it's a fun story if you want to give it a read. Goes into the prison, kind of has that Mr. Robot feel with the USBs. Um, uh, did yeah, they use, did they use rubber duckies or was it, yeah, they did use uh, duckies. Yeah, there you go. Oh, Real life, Mr. Robot. Generally what you would imagine uh, such an attack to be, if you're kind of familiar with it. Just the fun story to kind of talk about. There's <clears throat> there's nothing crazy in here. There's nothing astounding, but... So I, I will mention that she uh, basically impersonated a health inspector. And I think part of the reason that she went in instead of her son was she actually had, uh, within the previous few years, she had some experience in that area with like, she had experience uh, there, but she also just wanted to do that, and then they kind oh, of yes. found a way to make it work, and the yeah. inspection was kind of the cover that worked. Yeah. Or that they thought would work. And, I mean, that's a really common cover, any sort of inspector, because it's somebody that kind of has some sort of authority that you're generally just not going to question. Yeah. Um, there were a few funny points in the article. Uh, they said that uh, she even did such a good job, they they even let her keep her cell phone going into the prison, which uh, I, I can imagine probably isn't, you know, isn't something Isn't an ideal situation, probably. yeah. Yeah. Um, and yeah, she got full access to the prison. So, you know, one of those fun stories. Real life Mr. Robot. Just keep it in mind when you're, next time you're arrested. Yep, for sure. Just get your mom to impersonate a health inspector. She'll come break you out. <laughs> Uh, getting into some exploits, though, uh, we have named vulnerabilities, so you know it's serious because it's a named vulnerability. And uh, that is Crook. Uh, I, I think I'm saying that right. It's kind of a weird named vulnerability, actually. Um, but yeah, it's a vulnerability in Wi-Fi encryption. Uh, it's common in quite a few chips. It's common in, like, uh, Cypress, uh, Broadcom. Um, it's in, those, like, Cisco. Those would be the two big ones. I mean, Broadcom those especially, ones, yeah. like. I mean, so many phones are using one of those two. Yeah. Um, so, and it effectively allows unauthorized decryption of some of the WPA2 encrypted traffic. So, you yeah. know, the whole purpose of WPA2, encrypting your traffic, no longer, you know, serves that purpose. Yeah. And uh, it seems the issue, uh, at least at a high level, is that certain devices 
uh, they can send a number of Wi-Fi frames encrypted with a static um, pairwise temporal key or PTK after handling a disassociation well, event. So, so, so what happens? Um, okay. Once a device has been disassociated, uh, it's transient key. So the transient key is essentially the key that's established to encrypt the WPA2 frames. Um, so all the traffic, yeah, you send a frame out, it's using this key. Um, when you disassociate from the host, you know, you're essentially disconnecting, it's going to zero that key out, which uh, makes sense. No longer in use, just zero it and go along with your day. Um, the problem is there can still be some data frames sitting on the TX buffer. Um, and those will still end up being processed as normal and then sent out using this zeroed key. Um, so an attacker sense. who can cause that disassociation, um, can then cause that zero key to be used for some of the traffic uh, that's still kind of sitting on the buffer waiting to be sent out and then it'll be sent out with that zero key. Uh, so that's the gist of the attack. Essentially, you only get the few frames, uh, but, you know, well-timed or whatever, you might be able to use that. Um, this does only have a CVSS score of 3.1. Yeah, because um, it only impacts confidentiality. Yeah, um, but at the same time, that's all WPA2 is really about, is protecting that confidentiality. Yeah, that's true. I think the, the 3.1 definitely is low. That being said, I mean, well, obviously, CVSS gonna, can't really cater to the specific... I was going to say, this is one of those cases where CVSS just isn't... It doesn't take into account kind of the environment in which it's used and what it needs. Like, I mean, you do have the temporal scores, you could say, that has, like, a high requirement, and that bumps the score off from, like, 3.1 to... 3.6 or something like that. Yeah, I I, I'd want to say 3.8, but I, yeah, not I might much. be mistaken. Yeah, it's not going to make a huge change, but, you know, in context, like, this matters quite a bit because that's what, <laughs> that's the purpose of having the encryption in the first place is. Yeah, it, it basically breaks the entire purpose of it. Um, I think, like one of the biggest things though is probably the number of devices it affects uh they say it affects qualcomm realtek uh ra link mediatek like there's so many devices affected that they can't even really list them all and they're actually not even sure if, if there's other devices it affects that they just haven't found yet um so yeah seems to be one of those one of those very widespread issues um that yeah like you said, i mean it basically breaks the purpose of it I, that's really just you know at such a low level i mean it's in the wi-fi stack on those chips like it is it is a low level Dependency, issue that basically. it's really able to it's able to spread quite a bit is essentially what i'm getting at yeah. you know however many phones there are most of them are probably using this sort of chip yeah and keeping on the topic of crypto we have a zdi post for cve 2020-0688 which is a remote code execution uh, bug in the Microsoft Exchange server through fixed cryptographic keys. Yeah, and so, so you mentioned uh, on the last one that Crook was a weird name, but I'm going to say that Forgot 2K EY Exchange is a much worse name. I wasn't name even called. aware of that name. Where did that name come from? <laughs> that, that is... Just, is that just a name people came up with? They didn't officially give it that name, did they? Because well, I don't remember seeing that. Let's see. Yeah, I don't see it in here. Whoops. It's probably one of those bugs. That, it's like, definitely a name, name I saw on. coming around with this one. Um, yeah. Unless it was in with the patch. Like, I've definitely seen it. Um, yeah, and at least I've been calling this a, a named problem. vulnerability. And I don't know. That is kind of a dumb name, to be honest. Like, yeah, I don't agree with it. Take it out. Redo it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, to be fair, I'm not seeing it in here, and I don't didn't see it on the patch page, so maybe we only have two named vulns to talk about. Yeah, I, I'm I'm just gonna say this one isn't a named vuln because that name is terrible. <laughs> <laughs> um, Definitely seen a lot. Um, that said, I, this is also one of those cases. Um, I was reminded of XKCD. Uh, before I mention that, the entire issue, if you're familiar with kind of how a lot of .NET or ASP.NET web applications are built is they use this view state parameter. Um, and the view state is like this big blob, sometimes encrypted, sometimes just uh, 
they have a Mac on it, but essentially this blob of state information. Um, you could think of it kind of like, kind of like your session. Um, if you're familiar, like on PHP, you might have a session store, um, or other languages have similar functionality too. But the idea being, this is information that generally you don't want the user to be able to edit. Usually you're not wanting them to see it either, but depending on the mechanism, that may or may not be visible, but they shouldn't be able to change these values. Um, and using the view state, it essentially stores those values on the client, so the server doesn't need to maintain a database of all the sessions or maintain any sort of session information. The client just sends back the view state, and as long as it's encrypted properly, it's fine. Uh, so the issue with uh, the Exchange server is that it doesn't create unique cryptographic keys at the time of installation. It just uses kind of the fixed key. So as I was mentioning, it reminded me of XKCD, the, um, you know, int get random number return for <laughs> that one. We yes. were talking about that one on IRC yesterday, actually. <laughs> uh, that That's a classic. But um, yeah, pretty straightforward issue, um, which was actually a bit surprising to me. Uh, usually the ZDI blog posts are usually a bit more head scratching. They're like very technical. This one was kind of the exception there. It's kind of more of a high level, uh, you know, yeah, well, uh, article. It's a, it's it's a web issue. It does. So the view state is a serialized blob of data. Um, so this is another one of those deserialization issues where if you're able to control the data that's being deserialized, you're able to potentially get code execution by choosing what you deserialize. Um, yeah, so, so I did want to mention there, there was actually a bit of confusion. Um, they mentioned it first, Microsoft and their advisory actually stated it was a memory corruption issue. Um, they didn't, which like, I thought was weird, but yeah, they mentioned, yeah, I don't know how they did that, but you know, that I think, I think that's worth bringing up cause that's kind of a, it's kind of funny. Well, I mean, um, co it's code execution, Microsoft exchange server. What else would it be? Yep. Has to be memory <laughs> corruption, <laughs> but, uh, yeah, overall, I think the article was, uh, pretty accessible. I like, you know, oh, they definitely. Have, like, the video and stuff there. So, uh, yeah. Not, not too technical. It's uh, fairly easy to understand. Um, did you have anything else you wanted to add on there? Because I, I know I kind of cut you off a little bit uh, earlier. No, um, I will try and figure out where I got that name from because I'm I'm <laughs> sure I, I've seen it being passed around. So, you know, it came from somewhere. Okay. So we will get back on the topic of uh, named vulns, which is uh, Ghost Cat is our next one. Uh, which is a local file inclusion vulnerability in Tomcat, which uh, Tomcat's an open source Java based uh, HTTP server. They they have a bunch of like different things in it. Um, but according to uh, Chaitin Tech, this vulnerability actually existed for over a decade in the code base, um, which is why they vulnerability. Gave it that name. I'm saying that in quotes. Okay, um, so we'll we'll get into that uh, a little bit in a second. Um, I will say it seems to be a pretty simple issue, but one thing uh, that's worth noting about these, this article is they stay very uh, focused on not revealing technical details of it. Uh, you know, they they say like what circumstances it could be exploited under, um, some of the like high level details and what you can do to remediate it. And they even have this online detection tool, uh, but they don't have technical details right in the article. You kind of have to go. No, there, for that there's yourself. like 10, 20 proof of concepts already out there. Yeah. There's already exploits out there. So there is information out there. It's just not in the article. But I mean, so the thing is, this is just using features of, AJP, like the pro uh, it's Apache JServe protocol. Essentially, what this is used is rather than so, let's say you're in an environment, you've got a load balancer and a bunch of servers that have workers on them. Load balancer takes the incoming HTTP request, passes it on to one of these actual JServe protocol or Apache JServe protocol connectors, which is kind of its own binary protocol. Um, passes on to that, which then executes kind of the appropriate um, application. Uh, so that's used, like I mentioned, load balancers, sending it off to workers. So it's just a bit of a performance gain by using a protocol that's specific to the type of application you're working with. Um, if you're familiar on Python, you'll sometimes see like micro WSGI, kind of a similar idea. It's, it's a protocol being used to pass request information to the application besides in a way other than just sending the http request over 
So you, if you expose that on the internet, rather than only being exposed through, uh, to local hosts or only being exposed to authorized clients, or it was possible to set a secret on this that had to be sent before it would start to, um, so, I mean, essentially, you're just able to make requests directly to through the connector. So, if you're running, say, a manager application that lets you upload new applications to actually be run, which is reasonably common, you can then do that using the connector directly, um, which is how the file upload ends up happening, is if the manager's running, you can just upload your new application for it to run. It's another one of those issues where the issue is more about the port being exposed to the wide internet than it is, like, the actual capability, I guess. Yeah, the default, so, and that's what, like, Tomcat, their default now is to bind to local hosts, not to Quad Zero. Yeah. Uh, and I mean, like, there are fair things that they can do, like, having same defaults is a good move. At the same time, this is... AJP working as it's supposed to. It's a bit of a stress to say it's um, a vulnerability. It's more just an insecure default, I guess. That that's more where I would go. It's definitely something that's able to be abused. Like I mean, tons of places have, you know, and this, it's not just AJP. Like most, maybe not most, a lot of these sort of connectors will have this sort of vulnerability if you expose it. These things aren't meant to be exposed onto the internet. It's meant to be used by the applications just between trusted sources. Which, to um, be fair, I guess you could consider that it binds to 0.0.0.0, .0 to be evolved, considering it's not supposed to be exposed, and it is by default. Well, like, but guess the thing is, it needs to be exposed on the evolved. network in most cases, but that yeah. network shouldn't be exposed to the internet. Because being on 127.0.0.1, no load balancer can hit it. Mm, okay. Um. Like you need it, it makes sense to be there. It's just, oh no, putting on 127, you need to be explicit about putting on the network now. I, I think that's just a net positive. Yeah. Uh, it's just, I, as, as an issue, and I should also mention that you did have to, you're able to, using this protocol, you're able to kind of set some Java attributes to pass in, and that's how they were able to get the file read, uh, rather than just being able to make a normal request. Uh, to the application, having it kind of go through the normal router. Uh, yeah. So one of the things Tomcat introduced was uh, setting a request attribute pattern that could be used to block, just trying to set random attributes, which could also be used to block this attack, should you need this on the internet. Yeah. Um, I, I do want to say some things on the article itself. Uh, I thought the online detection little tool they had was really cool. Um, but this is kind of a unique approach to disclosure that I think I, I haven't really seen much of before uh, in regards to, uh, you know, they provide some details, some of those higher level details, which obviously we have seen before. We've seen advisories that don't put out technical details. But I think that aspect of actively trying to make it easy to detect if it affects you with the like tool they wrote um, is kind of something I haven't really seen before. Usually uh, when no, you so see those kinds of tools, there is more technical details about it as well. We saw that with uh, Cable Haunt. Did we? Did they have something um, like that? I, well, they did have the online assessment tool like that. They also had details. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. Like, It's rare that you see the detection tool without the details as well. Um, I feel like it's rare that you get the detection tool in general. Yeah. Uh, I, I do want to... I was thinking, like, th does this, like, perfectly align with, like, your kind of angle on disclosure? Because I know you, you kind of go back and forth, but I generally, no. you know, you edge <laughs> on non-full disclosure. And this is kind of... Well, you I know, edge no on non-disclosure, but... but encouraging the vendor to disclose fully. Okay, so non-full disclosure on behalf of, like, the researcher without approval is, yeah, okay. Kind of. And like I said, I've definitely been actively kind of changing that, and I've want to say I'm going to lean more towards just responsible and coordinated disclosure, which is somewhat similar to what was already, but having that, because the threat of full disclosure, I do believe is necessary. Um, yeah. So while I, I take the position of not disclosing, or at least I have, like that's not something that I encourage everybody to go and do. Like, I don't believe it's the case that nobody should ever disclose. It's just my personal position that I 
wouldn't be. And even, like I mentioned, that's changing, but that's one of those nuances that was there because that thread of full disclosure needs to be there. Otherwise, it just gets ignored. Yeah, I do want to say, like, uh, you know, all the exploits and POCs aside that are out there, let's say, like, none of those existed, just this article existed. Do you think their approach was, like, fair here, just given that, you know, how many servers could be affected? Uh, do you think well, it was fair for them to omit technical details for people who might want to, you know, exploit it as an end day? Or, for lack of a better I word? mean, I have no problem with them omitting details, and they did this after yeah. patches were out. Yeah, I was just wondering, like, for this case specifically, like, do you think it's more fair than, like, some other case we've seen in the past? I I'm kind of edging well, on I wouldn't that it is. I wouldn't complain about it, except when we're trying to analyze the details. Um, <laughs> yeah, fair enough. In any case, about this sort of disclosure. Uh, the fact they release a tool probably gives away more than you'd want. Yeah. Yeah, that's fair. I just thought their uh, their approach was a bit interesting. But uh, yeah, we we can definitely move on. Yeah, I, I um, mean, I'm certainly not complaining about their approach. Yeah. So <laughs> it's been a little while since we've covered OpenBSD, but uh, it's crawled back in. OpenBSD is like the Thanos of vulnerabilities. It's inevitable. <laughs> There's going to be more. Um, so yeah, this this actually was this uh, like the advisory was put out I think on Monday last week when we were doing the podcast. What's well, so the technical actually, details? Didn't before go out we until the jump in, um clarify on that i've always kind of seen openbsd being put out as being reasonably more secure at least compared with freebsd oh for yeah um uh, but you're just saying kernel. that all the openbsd stuff is now inevitable or are you just referring kind of user lines? i know we've talked about open I, I'm, smtp I'm to, so i'll clarify there i am talking about user lens so openbsd uh, a, a bit of background before we jump into it. OpenBSD is kind of weird because its kernel stance on security is very good. Um, they don't use legacy code. Uh, they they're very up to date on mitigations compared to their you know uh, brothers and sisters FreeBSD and NetBSD. Um, but I mean, you can have all the kernel protection in the world, but if you have userland root binaries like OpenSMTPD having all these issues that we're talking about, like I want to say on like a monthly basis, at least uh, those don't really matter. So it's one of those things where it is secure, but it's not, it's kind of, it's kind of in a weird stasis because just because of how insecure the user land aspects are. Um, but yeah, we can, we can jump into this issue specifically. Um, it's, it's basically an out of bounds read in the mail server, which is open SMTPD. Um, and the issue is in how they parse uh, replies. So replies, they can, they mention they can have these uh, codes. So let me just scroll down to it for people who are watching. Um, they say that they can respond with either single line or multi-line responses. And the first lines begin with a three digit code and a hyphen followed by optional text. And then the last line is followed by that same three digit code followed by an optional space and text. Um, but the problem is if you uh, don't use that optional space and text, there's actually a, an out of bounds right because they add four to the uh, line for the pointer P on uh, 1196 that I'm showing here. And they just do that indiscriminately, regardless if you pass that you know extra space and optional information. So it ends up writing past the end of the null terminator for the string. Um, it, very straightforward issue that's pretty blatant. Uh, kind of surprising that like this even, how did this not get spotted before? Uh, but you know, it's, it's a very simple issue. Uh, well, so fits. it ends up reading past, not writing past. Yeah. Sorry. Um, yeah, reading just because that's being passed in there as where it's reading. So it's put it, well, kind of it's writing from P into, uh, the reply buffer. Yeah. Um, now it is just an out of bounds read, but they were able to turn this into, um remote code execution of course i don't know did you want to talk about that or i can go into the details uh you can go into the details about that i was just gonna say before you do um 
you know, basically the fix for this was basically just to add a, a check on the else statement that's there to check if length is over four before doing it. So very simple fix. Uh, you can go into the exploitation details though, for sure. Yeah, so with the exploitation details, it basically just comes into the fact that one is that they can control the data that's still beyond kind of the end just because of how open SMTP is reading uh, the data. It's reading it and blocked. It's not just reading it like character. It's not processing this character by character uh, because of the blocks. So they're able to control the data that kind of is next after that pointer. Uh, so they can control what information's read there so they can include basically any data they want into uh into there so as we mentioned this is a code where you have kind of your code space description text uh so that gets written in there basically explicitly as just uh uh the error line as one of the fields written to the envelope essentially you know your envelope's just containing a bunch of header I say header because it reminds me of the HTML or HTTP headers uh, where he basically got the name of it colon value. It, they do the same thing here, airline colon, and then whatever that text is that it reads uh, goes in there as the airline. Um, so in this case, you can start injecting because they just control the data. It's just reading for the null terminator. Um, they can start injecting uh, new lines into it. By injecting new lines, they can start adding in new fields to that envelope file, such as changing the type. Uh, so what they do is they change the type or they inject. I'll just try and pull it up here. There we go. Uh, so they inject uh, type MDA, MDA exact, their command, dispatcher, and the user run it as root. Uh, they essentially just inject that into the envelope, and now when that gets executed, or when that gets run or sent, uh, basically off the MTA queue, it's going to go ahead and see it's, you know, the MDA, it's going to execute the commands as root. And that's the biggest problem, is the as root. Uh, that's one half of the biggest problem. The other half is this is also, uh, you know, it's not in any like specialized configuration area. This is in default installs. So it's a default install root escalation, and it's not really that complex of an attack to pull off. So, so I mean, it is kind of, so it's not terribly complicated, but when you get on the server side, there are like, when you want to exploit this over the server, because what I've just talked about is kind of a client side, um, injecting it in there. Server's a little bit more complicated, uh, just because you can't, like, it'll just reject the double bounce, so you can't just inject the bounce. Um, so instead, that's where they use a temporary error, get it cached, crash, you have to crash the, server, the server or restart the uh, service. So it loses that cache and then re goes through the queue, processes it again. So, like, it, it's there is some added complexity. It's not just like a run the script and instantly get root on a remote server. And there are kind of some more details that we've just hand waved over with this. Uh, but the actual write up here is pretty clear. If you're actually interested in trying this out for yourself, it's all the information you need is available here. I, I will actually say, I don't know if I totally agree with that. Mostly just because uh, there's two things that I wish this write up had more of. Uh, for one, the code snippets they provide are I think they could have been uh, more complete because they kind of cut things, some things out that you know they would be nice. They include the line to numbers have, like, though for you to pull flow. it up yourself. They do, and that's what I mean. But like, it'd be nice if you didn't even have to do that. Just include, just include the full like code block, and then just omit like some code that's irrelevant. Don't do these weird like here's a piece and then here's another piece and then here's another piece jumping. But like, you know what I mean? It's kind of segmented, uh, weird. And then the other thing is, I wish they kind of uh, linked the patch in the advisory. I had to go digging for it to find, uh, just because I did. I do like to cover the patch if we can, uh, just because it kind of you know uh, is part of you know the fix for the bug. It, it it's interesting to know, uh, but they don't have that easily accessible. I do wish that they did at least link to the patch so that you could you know look at it and and see. Uh, just so to, I like, do want to comment. The issue. Like, I actually like how they only use part of the code because otherwise we're looking at over a hundred lines of code between the start and the 
Uh, not even the end of the function, just the end of what they're showing. I, I'm not saying include the full function code. I'm saying, like, just do, like, uh, like what I like to do in my write-ups is I do, like, a uh, comment. So I do a double slash dot 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 for a relevant code. Um, but, like, keep it all in one block. You know what I mean? Because what I found, uh, like, hard to read with their uh, code snippets was a lot of the control flow was omitted. And that was kind of throwing me off. Uh, like some of that code was only accessible through uh, the if and else, like the if block, and they they kind of cut that out uh, of like one of their snippets. So it was a little bit confusing. To yeah, I mean, I'd argue they show what's relevant, but I suppose okay. we can disagree on that or disagree yeah, on the process. Yeah, agree to disagree. <laughs> but uh, yeah, overall, I mean, yeah, the you know the issue itself is fairly straightforward. Exploiting it on the server side might not be. Um, but yeah, you know, just another open BSD issue, another week, another BSD issue or open BSD issue, I should say. Um, but getting into some hacker one reports, we have a, a blind server side request forgery on NordVPN. We have a lot of recurring names in this episode, by the way, <laughs> uh, like from yeah, last I forgot episode, we had another four. Nord one. Yeah. So, you know, another Nord one. Um, this one is a, a S surf on uh, debug.nordvpn.com. Uh, it's basically it, this debug.nordvpn.com seems to be a service they're running for application monitoring and error tracking. Yeah, well, they're um, running Sentry. Sentry. I mentioned yeah. Sentry. It's used exactly for that. You can send it like crash reporting and stuff. Yeah. So one feature that ships with Sentry is called source code scraping, uh, which is toggled on by default. And this feature basically allows you to make blind get requests on behalf of the server. So... You know, it's not a, you know, terribly deep issue. It's just abusing a feature that's on by default, which is kind of similar to uh, that chain tech issue we covered earlier, actually. Yeah, I mean, um, in this case, you get to provide a file name that can be, you know, HTTP colon slash slash URL to an actual file, and it'll just make that request. Um, you're just telling it what file to go download. Yeah, and I will say this seems to be a fairly, uh, like, an issue that's kind of happened before. I don't think it's exactly the same, but I'm going to bring it up. I think Hacker One itself actually had another uh, blind uh, surf on their Sentry uh, instance. So, and this guy actually got a lot more because of like a bonus. But um, yeah, it's worth noting that this is you know it's not the only case of this happening. Uh, there have been other similar issues uh, with Sentry. Um, but yeah, it was fixed quickly. It was fixed within a few days. Uh, he was awarded $100. Um, one thing I found kind of funny was if you look in the comments, there was actually a duplicate issue filed one day within one day of the report being submitted. That seems like kind of uh, interesting to be a coincidence that like within that. Well, very it might have just window, been that they just deployed it also. Yeah, it could be something. Or like I that. mean, this was around when. They probably started it also, like started the program, because yeah. I mean, the NordVPN program hasn't been around. It, they started for, after their like crypto issues, right? That which was in December. Yeah, yeah. So. The, it just says launched in December 2019, and that was December 12, 2019. Yeah. So, so it enough. could have just been the fact that it was so early, like yeah. really early in terms of when they started it. And that's obviously when it's most competitive. It could also be that maybe that other issue was filed first, but wasn't reviewed until after this issue was. Uh, I don't know. I can't confirm that because the duplicate issue is uh, private. Generally um, speaking, um, they're going to triage them in order. So okay. you're not going to get marked as a duplicate if you reported it before someone else. Okay, fair enough. Um, but yeah, so kind of a cool issue. You know, it it's not too... I don't think it's too like hackful but you know you no but i, I so. see sir or sorry s surf i've been trying it's... to hold back on saying c surf too <laughs> <laughs> yeah it is c surf's definitely the more common one but yeah server side request for it's one of those issues that i've always liked it but you don't see it getting used too often or getting reported too often yeah. Um, and I mean, the types of things you can do with that, like if you played around with it, first of all, that's an attack service for Sentry itself. You know, maybe that file, being able to control that file, how it processes it, he might be able to attack Sentry. 
Um, ignoring that, though, you're making a request as a server. You're able to access or get requests made to internal services. In this case, you don't see much information. It is blind, so what information you can pull out of that is pretty limited. Um, in other cases, you know, you can do things like port scanning internal services, port scanning local hosts, seeing what's running locally. Um, there are attacks that can take advantage of it. It's one of those attacks that gets used in more complicated attacks rather than necessarily being attacks. used on its own. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, it's, I don't know, I thought it was one of the more interesting issues to come up this week. Yep. Or at least uh, disclosed this week. Obviously, as was mentioned, it was found, you know, three months ago, but they disclosed that a week ago. Yeah. Uh, another kind of weird issue that uh, I don't know if I don't I don't think we've covered before is uh, another hacker one bounty, this time in Maximum, which is an agency for uh, employer branding and advertising for recruiting. And uh, basically, the issue is you can set the X request ID header and get requests. So you can pull off something called CRLF injection. <clears throat> that doesn't sound for anything, uh, or that doesn't stand for anything like super cool. It's it's literally seems to be carriage return uh, line, line feed. Yeah, injection. it's a new line injection. Um, and yeah. that's so why that matters though is first of all, it's kind of an older attack that has been seeing some significant revival in the last little while, especially with request smuggling. Uh, but uh, with HTTP headers. You're a, or they're separated by CR and LF. It's not just a new line. You've got the carriage return also. Um, or we can debate if carriage return and line fee makes a new line. We can fight over that. No. That's an operating oh, system difference. But um, <laughs> uh, but the idea is you can inject headers or you inject a new line, then empty line. So two new lines. And you'll end up essentially being able to write your own body to the response. So that gives you cross-site scripting, that gives you complete control over the response content. Or you can just include other headers in there. Um, so what's interesting is since this is you send it the request ID header, that ends up just being repeated back, uh, potentially including new lines. So effectively it's a reflected cross-site scripting or could be used for that. Uh, the actual use of a reflected cross-site scripting in this case is essentially null. Uh, this is not something you can easily exploit. Uh, yeah, the one, the one exploitation too. case I could imagine is, as I mentioned, the web cache poisoning. Um, there's the chance that, you know, we, and we talked about uh, CPDOS a little while back. Yep. Oh, cache poisoning, denial of service. Oh, uh, that would kind of be the case here. You send a request ID in there. As long as that's not one of the keys that it's caching based off of, uh, you can basically have your request get cached and it would um, include whatever this cross-site scripting or whatever payload you included in it would be included in the cached response. Uh, that's about the only place I could see this because you can't do this in the browser. You can't just send an X request ID to a random endpoint like there's you can't just craft you can't just include your own headers for the most part uh especially now with flash dying i mean with flash you used to be able to uh have a little bit more control over the requests you could craft so you could do a little bit more such as including some headers uh but that hasn't been a thing even with flash for so including headers with flash is still kind of a thing but They've limited the headers you can include. It hasn't been a thing uh, since like 2014 or something. So like there isn't a good exploitation uh, or path to exploitation with this, which probably explains why they only gave a bounty of 50 bucks. Uh, and it's also a small company. They do say like their bounties are kind of low, um, which is, you know, cool that they still even pay out for it, to be honest. I do think pay out I, up I to 5,000 or sorry. No, that's uh, yeah, 5, total. Yeah. Yeah. Average bounty twenty five. Okay, so fair enough. Criticals get two fifty. Yeah, um, I do find it interesting. They have like medium severity at fifty dollars, but on the actual report, they have the severity as none. I don't know if that's just like a typo or something. Um, 
But yeah, I, I just noticed that when we were reading about it. So Yeah, I mean, it could be just their choice that it's worth paying out even if, you know, CVSS score is lower. Yeah. Um, so Joey and Chaff mentions, I honestly don't see how it could be exploited. The only way I really see the exploit possibly being done is through that web cache. Uh, if you, they have some sort of caching server in front of it, uh, that you would essentially, you would send the request with this malicious request ID header and, you know, whatever cache key. So if it's caching based on user agent and obviously the path or whatever, uh, but you'd make that request and then the cache will kind of hold on to that response. So it can be replayed to other people who make the same request. Uh, but without that header, as long as it doesn't use the request ID as a cache header, which because the Probably. request ID should be unique if it's even being sent, um, it shouldn't be caching that or shouldn't be caching based on that. So I wouldn't expect that. So that's the only place I can really see this possibly being exploited. The fact that it's not mentioned here, like it's mentioned as they could possibly do, but the fact that it's not demonstrated makes me think that it's also not possible in their setup. Yeah. But that's really, for an attack like this, that's really the only avenue to exploitation I can imagine. Yeah. Getting into some more technical issues, though, uh, we have uh, we have some CSGO days, finally. Not really. It's, well, it's since been CS a little 1. while. 6. What but, was that, episode two, I think? CSGO yeah, days? Yeah, CSGO days is really old. Um, but yeah, this, well, this game though is even older than csgo it's cs 1.6 so it's yeah, not well, quite so a csgo day but you know. it's the gold source engine which has obviously been superseded now by the source engine uh i guess gold source was first used with half-life back in 98 um although Oldie. valve does still uh continue to support gold source uh even till today yep yeah, they still do periodic updates on it Oh, okay. Um, I mean, that's they even say here that looks like it was fixed in a recent engine update. Now, the interesting thing here is this is two years old. It was just yeah. disclosed four days ago, but the issue is two years old. It took them a year to fix it. Yeah. Um, so I, I will get into some of the technical details. Um, the issue basically comes down to a malformed uh, BMP file. Um, BMP files are used in Counter-Strike for like custom maps and stuff like that. Uh, it's definitely been a source of issues in the past. It's a custom file format, so it's kind of a, you know, gold farm for uh, finding issues. So, you know, you can well, imagine. So BMP isn't custom, isn't a custom but, format, but, but is it in... Is. Okay. Yeah, yeah so the so format is... I should have corrected that. Yeah, the format is, but I think like the way they parse it is... Um, so yeah, like you said, the issue is pretty old, but it was just recently disclosed. We're still going to cover it. Um, the issue itself wasn't totally clear just from the actual report. I had to download the attachment and look at the source to see what the actual issue was. Uh, and it seems that there's a, a field in the header called uh, by CLR used, which is supposed to be like a quad count for like uh, 3D models and stuff like that. Um, and it's expected to be less or equal to 256, but there's no check on that. So if you pass it more than that, and I think their uh, exploit example passes 700, uh, you can end up corrupting stack memory. It's just a straight stack overflow. And because of how old CS 1.6 is, um, the stack is actually executable. So you can just inject shellcode onto the stack and jump to it and execute it, um, which is probably something that's, uh, you know, another interesting thing about this report. It's not very often nowadays that you see um you know classic shell coding attacks uh within like the last five years because most of the time you have non-executable stack uh but you know because it's so old it doesn't have that so uh yeah i would imagine no pick either uh probably not no well um, i mean if they know the stack location i would have to assume that they don't randomize pretty much yeah. anything either i mean the system might still do some but I'm going to guess it has the opt-out effect. You know what, actually, that is a really good point because I, I, I know some people who do some source engine exploitation and they always say like the hardest thing with trying to exploit source engine bugs uh, with modern source engine is getting around ASLR. Uh, info leaking can be very hard with like parsing bugs and stuff like that. Um, yeah, so, well, you that's know, that another reason why we don't tend to see these parsing bugs too often anymore. It's not that parsing suddenly done securely, because it's not. Um, instead, it's just because 
with something like this, you need to have all that information when you create the bitmap or the BMP file. Um, you can't kind of do any sort of dynamic, like leak it and then get the information. Not easily. Anyway. Right, well, yeah, I guess you could. You could craft the BMP file on the fly, but um, in this case, like, there's no way of doing that, or at least not with just this exploit. So that's another reason why you just don't see those parser errors like this too often anymore being exploited because ASLR uh, makes it a pain. Yeah. Um, this is kind of relevant because uh, Joey from the chat said CS 1.6 uh, still has players in some reason, uh, regions. Yeah, uh, I, I have been seeing some people kind of go back to CS 1.6. Uh, just, you know, I'm not going to go too much into it, but due to some of the meta around CSGO, some people are like, oh, screw it, I'm going to go back to 1.6. So it is kind of interesting to see that issue get disclosed now. Uh, and that's another thing I was going to touch on is, even though it is, you know, two years old, uh, or, or over two years old, um, I, th I think it's kind of funny that we are seeing it disclosed. Usually with Valve, they're very... Um, very close. They don't want anything disclosed usually. Well, almost all their hacker one bounties are uh, are you know private, secret. Um, but yeah, even you know it, it has been two years, so it is quite a thing. But you know it is cool to see uh, it get disclosed at least. Uh, I see you bring it up on the screen there. Yeah, there it looks like there, it looks like there's a mix of it. There's disclosure and there's non disclosure of them. Yeah. So I do wonder like how much of that is up to. Uh, I guess maybe the researchers not asking for it to be disclosed. I don't know. Which it definitely could be. Yeah. Um, so I, like I don't they want, could you know, be I'll hesitant. I'll play a bit of devil's advocate. Maybe it's just that people aren't pushing them to, and they only disclose it if people ask. So that you know, it's a possibility. Um, yeah, it yeah. still took them almost a year though to this guy asked to disclose it, and still took twelve months before they <laughs> That's true. agreed. Yeah. Um, the other thing with Valve, uh, for anybody that's listening who wants to do bug bounties, Valve is probably one of the better ones for HackerOne just because of their payouts. Um, if you find like an issue in Source Engine, not Gold Source Engine, but Source Engine, um, they've been known to pay out like uh, into like up to 10k, I think, is like their their range. Um, oh, maybe maybe not. I'm looking at the rewards page. No, 15. no, I, I've heard the same uh, because their maximum just has the dash there for criticals. Oh, yeah, okay. They just I was looking into two thousand. They don't have a maximum. Like they paid out apparently nine hundred and fifteen thousand dollars so far. Yeah, um, and so they, they say they their top bug well. bounty range is between twenty five hundred and twenty thousand. Yeah. So, so yeah, they pay out well, and it's binary stuff. That's fairly uncommon. When it comes to the hacker one bounties, there's sure. a lot of web, yeah. there's a lot of kind of network stuff, not so much that lets you do anything kind of binary. Yeah. So Source Engine is uh, one of those things that it'd be a cool target to look at. Uh, it would require, you know, getting some of that background knowledge, but, you know, that's just something that comes with the turf with binary, really. Um, but yeah, Valve is one of those companies that pays out more than a lot of other companies on Hacker One. So, you know, if you're looking for something to do, I would suggest Valve. So, you know, it's always fun to bring up their write-ups when they are actually uh, available. Uh, getting into another recurring guest, uh, the Samsung kernel. <laughs> at least at least recently, it's been a recurring guest. <clears throat> yeah, I think we had, was it last episode, we had three issues, and this um, episode we have another three issues. <laughs> not sure if it was last episode or the episode before. Yeah, it's, I'm not entirely certain, but I know it was with uh, the last It looks like it was weeks. episode 29. Okay, so the episode before. Um, but yeah, Samsung kernel is back. Uh, we have some uh, race conditions and other various bugs. Our first one's a race condition. Um, this one lives in the HDCP2 device driver. By the name, I'm guessing this is for HD copyright protection. Yeah, um, that would that would make sense for it. Um, I will also mention. Oh, are you still there? You kind of cut out. Uh, yeah, my apologies there. Um. I was going to mention there, this one is a little bit more than just one issue. Their report here is essentially saying everything is broken. Uh, the last line in this little summary, since no locking is implemented in HDCP session underscore close, memory will be corrupt in the system once they Basically, nothing's locked. Yeah. Uh, so you can race on apparently multiple. There are multiple exploitable race conditions as mentioned in the first line. Yeah. Um, 
Yeah, I downloaded the POC and took a look at it. It's a very, very straightforward exploit. It's literally just two threads, one running open and the other one, or sorry, it might be uh, the main thread runs open and then they just uh, run a thread that runs close concurrently with each other and they just race it. Uh, it's, you know, not a hard race at all. Um, I, it is worth mentioning this isn't accessible from an unprivileged context. Uh, you do need a privileged context, not root. But uh, you do need, you know, that foothold. You know, it's not completely unprivileged. You can't hit it from, like, the Chrome sandbox, for example. So it's it's an issue, but it's not as serious as it could be. Um, but yeah, race conditions are fun and Samsung kernel. Um, another Samsung kernel issue we have is an arbitrary free, which is actually a bug type you don't see too often anymore. So that's why it's, uh, you know, always fun to see it brought up. Um, this one is in the... A video system for Linux, I think it stands for, VS4L, which I think we actually did cover in episode 29 as well. Uh, other issues in uh, VS4L. Yeah, um, I believe we did. Yeah. So these issues are accessible from the dev uh, VIPX and Vertex uh, device drivers, which allows users to pass a command called VS4L underscore Vertex IOC QBuff. Um, and that basically just reads a table of pointers from user land and replaces replaces each pointer with a kernel pointer. But on error, it will iterate all those pointers in the table and k-free them uh, indiscriminately of how many were actually converted. So you can get any pointer in that table to be arbitrarily freed. Um, and that's obviously, that's a very powerful bug because it, it allows you to do a targeted UAF uh, on any object you can leak. Now, that last part is kind of important. Uh, it's a cool bug, but it is typically pretty difficult to exploit because you do need an info leak, and you need an info leak that leaks an object that's viable enough that you can free it, and it's a good UAF target as well. So uh, I, yeah, I know this, that just because... It's definitely part of the chain. It's not, it's not yeah, a standalone you need a, you issue. you need something else. Um, I just know that because uh, the 4.05 PS4 kernel exploit was actually an arbitrary free as well. And... Uh, you know, the arbitrary free itself wasn't too hard to get going, but getting an actual candidate object and leaking it, that was very difficult. Although, so, one option could be double free. Uh, so, I, I'm thinking, I'm not familiar enough with the K-free uh, to comment here, but um, do you know what protection, like, how strict is its double free protection compared so with... Uh, like user land heaps. So the Linux kernel does have an option for um, preventing double free attacks, like checking the free list before freeing it again, but it's not enabled by default. By default, there's no protection on KFree for double free attacks. And I imagine Samsung doesn't change that default. It could be wrong, but I don't imagine. I would imagine not. I just didn't want to. Yeah make that claim here because i'm not familiar enough with the android yeah so that uh, mitigation is there, there. So, it's just not enabled usually because the performance overhead is too high right yeah uh, so that would be another kernel that would be another way to kind of consider attacking this yeah um it is worth noting you do need a valid object address though to k free uh, yeah yeah no you, well you so. still you still need like and you also need something to go and allocate and all of that like there's it's like yeah. it's still not a standalone issue like you need more than this double free just gets you it's some that can get you into a position to actually besides just use after free yeah but arbitrary free bugs you know uh they're kind of uh they're very rare that's it's not a very common vector so you know even though it is a hard attack to pull off i do like seeing them just because they're so rare um so yeah may maybe if you're looking at uh y if you want to do a hard kernel exploit there's one for you. Um, and then, so we were saying with that one that you would probably need a leak to, um, you know, exploit it. And funnily enough, our last Samsung kernel exploit actually is a pointer leak in the exact same driver <laughs> in VIPX. Um, they have an information leak in the uh, put container ioctal function. And uh, it basically just copies out a container list structure that contains a kernel pointer uh, just before it gets passed to k free there's nothing really complex involved it literally just copies out a structure that contains a kernel pointer in it and because this object is passed to k free it is a valid heap object so you might actually be able to chain this issue and the last issue to actually get a full chain um so that was kind of fun 
that, you know, these two issues that are in the exact same spot, you will most likely be able to chain them together to get code execution. So, um, you know, if you're looking to do kernel stuff, this is perfect. This this would kind of, you know, the information is there. It, you're not using a zero day, it's an end day. Uh, and you kind of learn how to chain together different bugs to uh, contribute to an overall exploit. Um, I think this would be like a very good avenue for anybody looking to get into Android exploitation to look at. Um, yeah, and to be clear, like this issue is pretty much like in terms of the leak is pretty much as simple as it gets. It's yeah. literally just it happens to straight up leak a container that contains a kernel pointer. Uh, yeah. The pointers do get freed immediately after this is sent out, so they're no longer two valid objects, but it still can be used well for the KSLR bypass. You could actually do the double free with that free. Like, that, you could just free yeah, it that too. It's, yeah. So, um, you know, very... This would be very cool to chain. Um, but yeah, it's it's omen hunting season on Samsung, man. Uh, some of these issues seem pretty low hanging fruit, and you know the last issues we covered on episode twenty nine were pretty low hanging fruit too. So, you know, Samsung's looking pretty. It's funny because they're getting some free assessments. Well, it's it's funny with Samsung because Androids, in terms of like just looking at Android. Samsung is typically considered the most secure. They they have the most secure sub uh, security based subsystems, uh, like they have the Knox mitigation, for example. Um, they try to go a little bit further with securing their devices. So it's kind of funny that we're seeing all these like trivial issues in uh, in the kernel um, on Samsung devices. So it seems like they kind of need to shift their focus less from mitigations and more onto just making the code not as uh, buggy because some of these issues are like you know just including a kernel pointer in a structure and then copying it out i don't even know how that really happens um anything that's been written in the last like 10 or 20 years that should absolutely not happen um that should kind of be at the forefront of your mind when you're writing a driver is, is stuff like that because just because of how well known it is at this point so yeah it, it does seem like the code quality on at least samsung is kind of poor in that regard so, you know, maybe we'll see more issues going forward. Uh, I wouldn't Given be that we've seen issues, uh, you know, as we mentioned, episode 29, and now it looks like at least some people over at Google are taking a look at Samsung. So I imagine we're going to keep seeing some issues for a while. Yeah. And it's worth no noting this issue was found by uh, Bazad from Google. And he's a, you know, he's a pretty noteworthy researcher. So, yeah, like you were saying, it seems Google's taking more of an interest in, uh, in Samsung stuff. Um, Moving away from exploits, though, and getting into some research papers, uh, we do love fuzzing, uh, and we do love kernel, as you could probably tell. And this paper kind of marries them together uh, with hybrid fuzzing for the Linux kernel. Um, so first, I think we should talk a little bit about the idea of hybrid fuzzing. Um, yeah, we did talk about it, I want to say, last episode or before when we talked about... Um some other hybrid fuzzing, but the basic idea is fuzzing plus concolic execution, which itself is symbolic execution plus concrete data. Uh, so basically you do your fuzz, you get kind of values for the registers and all of that, that going into a function that you symbolically execute, but you have knowledge about what register values are, what the kind of state is at the point of hitting that function. Uh, so you're able to use a symbolic execution to figure out how to change or how to get into different states. Yeah, and when you hear about how powerful that information can be, like obviously knowing the state of the machine while fuzzing can be very useful. Um, you know, when you hear that, if you're not familiar with the area, you may think, why isn't this already being done everywhere? And uh, part of the issue is, like one of the issues is state explosion, where your search complexity just grows the more branches you have to explore. And with something like Linux kernel, with how monolithic it is, um, that is very much a concern. Um, but the other thing is when you're dealing with a kernel environment, it's harder to pull off because you have, uh, it's, it's a lot harder to get some of that state information. Um, so the three main points they mention is indirect control transfer, uh, like function pointers, uh, tables, for example, which are very common in the kernel. Um, it can be hard to infer the correct sequence of system calls. Um, so, you know, without previous setup, some system calls could fail early and you may get state explosion in these kinds of scenarios because of how complex the system state gets. 
And then the other issue they mention is uh, nested input, where syscalls take a structure for an argument, um, and then like you know these structures can get pretty complex, and you want to know how to potentially solve some of the constraints on those structures. Um, so that's what they kind of aim to tackle with uh, HFL in this paper, is trying to solve some of these issues to make it easier to introduce hy hybrid fuzzing practically into the kernel. Um, so the ways they solved some of these issues was pretty novel, I thought. Um, for the indirect control transfers, they basically wrote like a static analysis tool to try to help with some of these issues. So for indirect control transfers, they wrote something they call the offline translator. Uh, and it basically, uh, at compile time, they look for indirect control flow. Uh, so, you know, they look for an operation that goes to use a function table, for example, and they basically rewrite it so that it uses if statements or like a switch statement so that it's more direct. Um, yeah, for what it's worth, that also introduces one of the limitations of this, which is you need source access, which isn't that much of an issue yeah, when we're talking about Linux, saying, but too. that is kind of what prevents us from just being fuzzing on any old thing or any old kernel is they do need to be able to rewrite some source. In theory, you might actually be able to do this at the binary level, like binary instrumentation to do this also. It um, but at least that hasn't... Oh, for sure. But yeah. it also, I don't think, has been explored at all. In this case, they're definitely not doing that, and that's one of those limitations being brought in. Yeah. Um, for the sequencing, uh, they set up a set of dependency pairs automatically. So the example they give is like a read and write. Obviously, a write has to happen before a read, or the read will just block and error out. So um, they detect like reads and writes, and they set up dependency pairs so that one has to happen before the other. Um, so that's how they solve some of the sequencing issues. Uh, and then for nested input, um, they do static analysis on the copy from user and copy to user API calls. Uh, for people unfamiliar with kernel, those are basically the calls that allow kernel to cross the kernel and user land boundary. Because typically you can't you can't just dereference it directly. For one, that was a bad idea, and for two, it's not possible anymore because of a uh, secure man uh, S map. I, I always mess up what it stands for. Uh, supervisor mode access prevention uh, or privileged access never uh, for ARM. But uh, yeah, because of those CPU mitigations, you have to use the copy from and copy to user calls when crossing that user land boundary. Um, so they do static analysis on that to determine the size of the structures. So they find all the like cross references to that in a target area. And then they look at the call to try to find the sizes of structures and pointers in the structure. Yeah, and this actually, they were, they referenced a lot with uh, Diffuse or Diffuse, uh, yeah. which is an Android fuzzer. I think we actually talked about kind of privately, uh, mm -hmm. which does a lot of this. And I just want to kind of mention that if you look up the, the Diffuse, you can come with both their paper and they have a, I'll just put it in chat, but, um, uh, they also have a presentation about that's quite good and kind of covers it fairly well. Um, so kind of for more information about doing that, I think their talk is actually really good. Yeah. So obviously when we talk about fuzzers, I say it all the time when we talk about fuzzers on here is uh, the, the metric that matters is uh, what does it do? What does it find? Um, and they actually seem to have some pretty promising results. Uh, first, they took 13 known crashes and compared how long it would take for their setup to find it compared to vanilla syscaller. Um, and it, apparently it found all of them about five hours faster than syscaller. Uh, they have that information on page 10, uh, figure 9, I think. Um, and then they also ended up discovering 24 uh, previously undiscovered uh, zero days, which they have uh, on the next page, on page 11. Um, there were mostly integer overflows and access violations, uh, not too many like use after freeze. There's a few in there. Yeah, I but, will um, add that nine of those were likely exploitable. The rest were just denial of services. Yeah. So, I mean, this kind of shows that uh, there is at least some promise in, in doing this, and I, I think it's actually really cool. Um, overall, I really like the approaches to how they tackled some of the issues. I particularly like the one where they solved the uh, nested input uh, idea with I analyzing the copy from and to user calls uh, for like identifying structure characteristics and stuff like that. I thought that was really neat. Um, I actually think the way they solved the issues was a little bit more interesting than the like fuzzing setup itself, uh, which I think it is worth mentioning. Um, 
they did build this on top of syscaller. It's not like its own standalone thing. Um, so yeah, that's how like some of their setup works. But yeah, I, re I really like the paper because it was really... Um... Yeah, which is also how the last one worked that we covered that did this hybrid fuzzing. Syscaller was the main fuzzer and then they had an extra system that was doing the concolic testing. Um, and then obviously they're feeding it more information to Syscaller with like the inferred arguments and stuff. Yeah, uh, but that that is how, like, generally speaking, they're not going to recreate the fuzzer for this. This is just looking at, um, well, combining the two systems. Yeah, but like the paper itself, um, often when we talk about fuzzing papers and stuff, they're pretty complex. What I liked about this paper was at least their goals were very clearly laid out and how they tackle them. They give a very good high level perspective of how they set out to tackle the issues. Sorry, uh, the issues and um yeah it's just it's it's very accessible and very clever with how they solve some of the issues so i really liked it uh did you have anything to add on there z nope no okay so our last uh research paper is a2 alexa when commodity commodity wi-fi devices turn into adversarial motion sensors so as the title suggests, it talks about using Wi-Fi to track the motion of people inside of buildings or rooms um, without compromising yeah, just, the actual Just before itself. we go into it, I do want to mention, unfortunately, this is kind of an older paper. First came out about two years ago, but it was just presented this last week at um, NDSS, which is the, uh, now I need to remember, uh, Network and Distribute System Security Symposium. Um so that's why we're we're just covering it now, even though it is a little bit older. You may may have seen it. It has been updated a bit more recently. Um, in fact, it's been updated a few times since the original release. But I think you just said this to put is that out V4, there, right? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Uh, by out of curiosity, do you have like a like a diff? I don't have of... the diff. No. Okay. Um, but yeah, we'll we'll cover the paper overall anyway because it is still kind of you know one of those fun papers. Um, they basically. All you need to do to pull off the attack that uh, they talk about is put a smartphone in a target room or just outside of a target room to act as an antenna, and that can pick up the strength of Wi-Fi signals to infer the presence of people in that room. Um, and it's based on some observations of Wi-Fi signal propagation, uh, notably that movement near a Wi-Fi transmitter changes the propagation of the signal. Uh, and then the other like important key factor that is built on top of is that most walls aren't insulate against Wi-Fi signals. So these signals can be picked up by somebody on the outside uh, that's observing. Um, so yeah, like it's it's just one of those vectors I think that you don't really think about often. Like you don't think about Wi-Fi signals potentially giving away your position in a room or something like that like using it as a motion sensor it's yeah, one of those it's, mediums that's not very commonly seen it's not super granular either like it's not giving like your exact position i've just pulled off one of the graphs they give showing how they'll notice how like a more of these signal will not necessarily be blocked by the person um doesn't show up too well here but it is just a light gray it just uh, the signal strength and stuff is a little bit different for more of the signals or less of the signals depending on how close you are to what they're calling the anchor, so to whatever's broadcasting. Uh, so that can be like your Wi-Fi router, but that can also be uh, in pretty much any Wi-Fi device um, that's able to detect. So that can be your printer, that can potentially be like your, well, I mean, where that name comes from, your Alexa devices. Yeah. Um, can be any of those things just to notice how the signal that it's sending out or that it's receiving is getting modified by the presence of a person. Um, Simple in concept. Obviously, they go into in the paper a lot more of the technical details, which, if it's interesting, but I think just as an attack, I thought it was a fun, fun attack idea. Yeah. And, I mean, they're um, showing it's practical. You know what this uh, reminds me of? I don't know if you've ever seen it. This reminds me of that, uh, that Batman uh, Dark Knight Rises, I think it was, movie. Um, near the end, they basically use, like, all the cell phones of all the citizens in the city to do, like, a full mapping of, like, where the, like, all the all the bad guys are and stuff like that uh, on all the floors of this skyscraper. Uh, they use it kind of like a, 
like sonar, I think, using people's phones. This isn't quite the same thing, but this kind of reminded me of that. And I thought that was kind of fun that you could connect uh, a real world attack loosely to like a, an attack you've seen in Hollywood. Um, that, that was like the first thing that popped in my head when I saw this paper. Yeah, I definitely um, say that sounds like a bit of a loose connection. Uh, that said, I have not seen. Uh, yeah, you got to see it. Then you'll be able to make more of the connection. Okay. <laughs> yeah, that's that's your homework for tonight. <laughs> um, but I, one thing they do say in this paper uh, is that they say they basically try to infer that it's a practical and a serious attack. They say it's a serious privacy concern. I, I don't know if I agree with that. Some of the you know scenarios they mentioned that it could be used for is like burglary, um, kidnapping, and casing robberies. I think the only one that could be practical is the casing robberies. Like, I could actually see this maybe being used in the case of like casing a jewelry store to see like the staff positions and how much they move during the day and stuff like that. Um, that could actually be pretty crazy. Um, I, I don't know if there's I any mean, robbers out be... there that'll try it, but. I feel like that could actually be used, you know, with basically any sort of targeted high value attack. So, Jewel, anything where you're willing to invest the time to actually do this sort of casing. And I mean, yeah. it is giving information about what's inside. So, inside of a building through the walls and stuff, which can be useful for, you know, some sort of high level or high value target kidnapping or something too. I like it's there i don't think it's a threat for the average person except maybe the burglary but with that the average person or in the average um incident of that is more uh crimes of opportunity than actually like doing significant like casing it out for like your average person's home yeah i think the privacy concern they bring up is the one i disagree with the most i don't think that's really I, it is like i mean it is a privacy concern it is like if you care about that it is a concern like it is some that leaks some privacy should it be a concern i'd kind of agree that maybe it's not much to need to worry about i mean yeah. in this case it, you've got to be somebody that's being targeted so for the no average person you're probably not being targeted in this way. Or if you are, if there's somebody willing to kind of go to this length, they're probably willing to do some other things too. That's what I was going to go with, is that they're probably not going to go with an attack this uh, noisy, or not noisy as in like detectable, because that's part of the thing. It's not very easily detectable. But um, I guess they'll probably go with something more accurate, is what I should say. Because like, like Although you were saying, this is like kind of commodity devices. Room, so. Like, it doesn't cost very much. You probably already have a phone. Yeah. Uh, so it makes it more like, accessible, I guess. Yeah, but it's not as accurate. So, like, if you're yeah. going for, like, a more targeted attack on, like, a high-value target, you're probably going to use something that's more reliable. No, um, I mean, I imagine your best case is more using, like, is this room empty or not? Yeah. Asking that sort of question, not, not actual information. And I mean, you can get like, it's even pretty cheap to get like a, um, I'm imagining like a thermal device, like a thermal camera, uh, yeah. to be able to kind of see through the walls a little bit and get similar information. Although I have no idea how practical that is against, you know, insulated walls outside of a building. I feel like it, I know glass won't do the thermal, so I don't know how that's going to be impacted by the insulation in a, which may be, you know, like a fiberglass insulation. Uh, so maybe that isn't a practical replacement, but I don't know. This definitely does feel like a poor attack. Yeah, in the real world, yeah. Yeah. But, you know, it's still fun to think about. Um, but yeah, that, that pretty much sums up our research papers. Uh, we're going to start, you know, heading towards wrapping up the show with uh, some shout outs. Uh, so Z, I'll let you do your uh, two shout outs first. Yeah, the first one here is uh, Checkpoint put out uh, a few days ago uh, their evasion techniques encyclopedia, I think is what they called it. They have a little blog post, but I've just pulled up the actual encyclopedia here. And it's nothing crazy like this isn't this is by no means complete but it's essentially a different detection or evasion techniques that have, they've seen in malware uh so techniques that malware would use to determine like 
hey, am I running in a in VMware? Am I running in VirtualBox or some virtualized environment? Um, and it's quite simply just that, you know, different file system techniques, you know, checking if so, uh, specific files exist. Um, code samples for everything. They do credit some other project. This Alcazar project uh, seems to be where they've gotten a lot of their code samples from. Uh, it was just interesting to kind of explore and take a look at that. Uh, so I figured I'd give them a quick shout out. And the second thing, uh, I thought, it turns out we had, I thought we had talked about a GitHub issue back in November, although it was actually reported, I think, like in 2016, but it got at least some popularity back in November, which involved a password reset, uh, taking advantage of, um, uh, when emails would get normalized to look them up in the database, um, it took advantage of case mapping collisions where when you made the email lowercase or multiple characters would map to the same lowercase character. Um, in this particular case, it took advantage of a uh, dotless I. Um, anyway, uh, I thought we had talked about we hadn't, but it is, it's one of those cases that it's really hard to kind of find in the wild. Like there's a lot of different Unicode things, but it helps to actually give it a, you know, try it to actually try and exploit it. Uh, so a bug crowd here does one, they have the write up, but this adversary.io released if I have a cool little lab that essentially just lets you practice exactly this sort of attack. Um, kind of walks you through it and i thought this was kind of an interesting programmer lab here that's actually what i want to shout out is adversary.io that said this is also like 30 euros a month and it looks like they're mostly focusing on corporate so you're probably not going to be paying for it but they do have some free things available too if you're kind of interested in some of the web attacks they do cover some other attacks besides just the uh this github and this email issue but it's just a chance to kind of play around with an attack that I haven't, I don't know of any CTFs. I haven't played any CTFs in the last little while. So maybe I just haven't seen it, but I haven't seen into many CTFs, but it, it's these Unicode issues definitely are around and people just aren't really looking for them. Um, sometimes limited where you can actually use it. So it's worth checking out, I think. And honestly, I like this adversary.io lab system, but I mean, the fact that they don't have a more consumer centric uh, system for you to like register and pay for. It's hard to recommend. Yeah. And you have to pay annually. It's 30 bucks, 30 euros a month, but you have to do it in an annual subscription. Also, I'm not even <clears> sure <throat> if you can do it without going through their sales. So it's not not something I'm actually recommending. But I will say, like, I like this whole this whole lab system where. Um, you know, enter your email and it updates the code to show you kind of what it would look like there, or you can have the original code, but yeah, it's pretty cool. Um, it's a really nice little lab system, especially kind of walking through the issues. Seems like this would be really useful for what they target, which is training developers to write secure code. <clears throat> mm -hmm. Um, I just wish it was a bit more open for, or a bit more accessible. Yeah, it seems very user friendly though. That's yeah, cool. yeah, that's what I really like <laughs> about this. I mean, I have no idea when adversary.io launched, but I just saw it there, saw that lab. Like it, it's it's a neat program. It's a neat lab system. Yeah. But you're very limited. You can sign up, you do get to do some free labs. So I mean you can take a look at for yourself, but yeah. I'll I'll leave it at that. Okay. Um yeah, I have a few shout outs as well. Uh, my, my first one is a uh, write-up by Nafod for pawning, uh, pawning VMware. Um, and this is actually part two of a two-part blog series. Uh, the previous one, which was done back in December, uh, he did a post about solving a CTF challenge from Real World CTF 2018. Um, this one talks about exploiting a real world bug in VMware uh, via ZDI 19421. Um, so... I mean, what I really liked about this blog post was he went through what was involved with getting a setup to properly start working on hitting VMware, uh, which is something a lot of write-ups skip over. A lot of write-ups don't touch on what's involved with like getting the initial setup to even start looking at it. Um, and he went through some of the struggles 
uh, with understanding it and link to various resources he used to try to get some background knowledge about the subsystems involved. Um, and yeah, he even showed like some of the information about like uh, how he got the bug and how the the advisory was a bit sparse, so he had to do like some bin diffing. He shows all of that, so that's why I really like this write up. Um, he does mention there is going to be a part three at some point in the future as well. Uh, it's teased that it's going to be about a bug in the virtual E1000 devices, but I think this is definitely worth a read for people who are interested in uh, virtual machines from like an exploitation perspective. Um, it's one of the best write-ups I've seen, I think, uh, for something low-level. I really like it, so you know, definitely worth checking out. Um, my second shout-out is a post from SensePost, which is an introduction to Chrome's V8 from an exploit development angle. Uh, for those of you who don't know, V8 is basically the JavaScript engine uh, for Chrome. And, um, you know, I wanted to shout this out because we've talked about Chrome issues before on this podcast and how browser exploitation can be so difficult to break into. Um, so whenever I see good articles about browser exploitation, I'm, I'm pretty much always going to shout them out because of how few resources are out there for that. Um, it also has some really nice graphs and visual aids to cover what's happening under the hood with various operations and stuff that you do in JavaScript. Um, so it's definitely, it's another one that's worth a read, especially if you're looking to get your feet wet in browser exploitation. I think this is a very good introductory introduction article to that. Um, so yeah, the, just wanted to give that a bit of a shout out. Um, obviously, you know, browser exploitation is pretty complex. So if you're new to exploitation, I wouldn't recommend it as a starting point, but if you're looking for something new to do is you know this is a good article to look into if you're looking to get into browser stuff um but yeah that pretty much sums up all of our uh, all of our topics i don't know if you had any last minute zo- notes see no i've got nothing really to add in there okay so um yeah you can catch the vods uh on youtube spotify and uh, apple podcasts and various other uh links that we have um the vods go up about 24 hours after the podcast goes live so usually tuesday afternoon uh, yeah, i we generally will Twitch. S- i'll schedule them five or uh, sorry 6 p.m eastern okay yeah so you know those will be up uh you can catch all the previous episodes there as well um you can check out our twitter and discord for updates and if you want to get involved in the community but uh, other than that yeah that pretty much sums up this podcast Uh, We will see you guys again next Monday at the same time, 3 p.m. Eastern. And yeah, we will see you then.